Hey, what's up? It's Tony from the Inside Job Podcast, and uh, I'm glad to see you. I'm glad to be here, and I want to get started immediately because I'm so excited for this one. Not really. So today we're gonna um, we're going to tackle uh, a subject that is a divisive one in the church and even outside of the church, right? But we're going to go for it, and we're going to see if we could find the will of God and the heart of Jesus right in the middle of it there. I, I just want to preface this by saying that I'm just going to approach this in a very, very rudimentary, generic way, right? I'm not going to go in depth. Um, I might do that um, in you know, in a couple of future episodes, actually I will, but today is just a, you know, a baseline generic overview of this particular subject that, um, we're going to tackle today and it's a hard one. And to tell you the truth, I'm, I'm kind of looking forward to it and I'm not, cause I know that I'm going to get some blowback from it, but Hey, listen, I, I'm, I'm just gonna, I, I just want to say that you know, I'm not the Bible answer man. I've, I, 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 you know, I don't have a magic wand here. I just want to open up the Bible and sort of see what it says and see how, and, 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 and you know, and find, um, find God's heart in it. And uh, I just want to, I'm just trying to figure this thing out here the best I can. So we're just going to open up the Bible and we're just going to approach it from that point of view and see what it says, right? And, um, and here we go. The, this uh, this podcast is about the role of women in the church, right? And is you know, and it's a tough one, and it's a divisive one, and it shouldn't be a divisive one, right? I mean, if 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 there's no, you know, if it's not a core doctrinal issue, right? Like like the deity of Jesus, or you know, or grace, or sin, or uh, you know, if it's not a, a, a core doctrinal issue, then it shouldn't be something that divides the uh, church. It, it shouldn't. This is more of an issue that, you know, one day we're all going to know the answer and, you know, that's okay. So I think it lives on the periphery. I think it's important, but I think it's on the periphery. I don't think it's a, do you know, a doctrinal issue that should divide the, you know, church because the world uh, needs to see us loving one another, needs to see the unity of the church, needs to see us ministering and loving each other in harmony, right? Because even Jesus said in John 17, right? He said, the world will know that I am who I say I was as a result of your oneness and unity. So please bear that in mind as um, I proceed. So here we go. So there's a few words that we have to understand before we even go into it. So one is called egalitarian. So what that word means is, is you know, simply it's the principle of um, all people are equal. All people have equal rights and equal roles and equal responsibilities, right? So it's, it's you know, it's basically saying all people are equal and should have the same opportunities and rights. Okay, that's, you know, and on surface that, you know, it sounds like a good thing, right? The another, uh, the second word, word is um, is complementarian. So that's the idea that, that people, um, are, you know, equal in worth and value, right? But they have different roles and responsibilities that complement one another. Okay. And the third wor word, I keep saying world for word. Ugh. The third word is transcultural. And transcultural means not bound by time or the context of the culture, right? So it lives outside of that. It's not bound by the culture or bound by the time, right? It's more, you know, absolute in nature. So those are the three words that we sort of have to understand before we even dive into this thing. So let's dive off, dive off of the diving board and and here we go. Okay. So that so one of the so remember this is a generic way of approaching approaching this issue but I'll do my best we're just going to read out of first uh, out of first Timothy chapter 2 verses 11 through 14 and Paul says this he says a woman should learn in quietness and full submission I do not permit a woman to teach or have authority over a man she must be quiet for Adam was formed first and then Eve 
And Adam was not deceived. It was, it was the woman who was deceived and became a sinner. First thing, let's just say that, okay, it, it, so it's clear that Paul was not, was, was just not too PC. He was not concerned about being politically correct, but, you know, he, he wasn't wearing his sensitivities on, you know, his sleeve, so to speak, but he, he clearly had something that he wanted to communicate here. And I, I think it's fairly clear. Okay, and, and and the reason why it's clear it's because it's it's not grounded in the times, um, um, in the culture, in the content of the culture. It's grounded in creation. So he grounds his argument. He you know undergirds his argument of I do not permit a woman to have authority or to teach over a man. He underlines it and he grounds it in the foundation of not the culture, but in creation. And that uh, is not bound by time, right? It's absolute. So he says, you know, he's, he, he says for Adam, Adam was formed first and then Eve. So, so right off the bat, he's, he's, you know, he's just talking about, you know, order. And he's talking about order and he's talking about gender. So it's a Gen, so it's a gender s s specific way that he's grounding this, this, this command he's saying, right? So right off the bat, that tells me that this is a transcultural thing that is not bound by, you know, it's not bound by the culture. Um, it's not bound by time. Okay. So, so it's transcultural. Okay. So this is transcultural. It's not cultural. It's not bound by time, but it's for everybody at all time. Okay. It is bound in gender and the order of creation. And I think Paul is just making that, you know, clear. So Paul is clearly forbidding something. He's not permitting something that this is, this is clear. So what is Paul forbidding? Okay. Because we see women prophetesses in the Old Testament, Miriam, Deborah, Moore. We see we see Philip had you know had a bunch of daughters in Acts chapter twenty one who were prophesizing. We see Paul wrote to you know he wrote he writes his colossal book Romans, and then at the end he puts in chapter sixteen he you know he thanks all of his helpers and servants and people in the church and i think he lists like 16 or 17 and 9 or 10 of them are women we see women following jesus part of part of his part of his ministry activities all right so clearly women women were prophets and and and, and you know and to me if you're prophesizing, that's a special language of God, right? I mean, that's that's just not some ordinary teaching or giving, giving you know, like opinions on something. I mean, that's more than, you know, a three-point PowerPoint thing that any pastor does on Sunday morning. And, you know, I, I mean, that's that's a special language. So that's, 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 that's a special gift and authority, right? I mean, it's given. So what what is Paul permitting then? If all of those things happened in the scriptures and continue to happen, what is he permitting, right? So we see, see here, um, so in 1 Timothy 2, right? I mean, we see a woman should learn in quietness. So quietness me, basically, basically means reverence, right? But it says a woman should learn. So many, many people who, you know, have a patriarchal view, which is a men rule only view and there's some that had it then of course and some that have it now this this would be appalling right a woman should should learn so that just infers I minute mean, women have the capacity to learn and should learn and that also implies if if you should learn something then you should have a capacity and a willingness and an ability to teach also right it's kind of like peanut butter and jelly or that's how i say it at least but um so it would make sense for them to be able to actually teach in some capacity. But it is clear that Paul is not permitting a woman to do something here. 
He says, have authority or teach over a man. So we got to deal with that. And I believe it's transcultural because it's bound in creation. So, so if you believe that, then what does that mean for us? You know, what does that mean for us? Notice what it does not say. It does not say that a woman should never teach or should never have authority on some level, right? But it says over a man. So what's the meat and potatoes of what Paul is getting at? And the, and the popular point of view, and my point of view is this too, right? That, that he's talking about the church, that this is something for the church of Jesus Christ as a whole, okay? Not for, not for a particular domination or not for a particular time, but for the church. It's absolute, right? So to me, he's, he's basically arguing this. He's saying that the church eldership, the authority that comes from church eldership, and the meat and potatoes and the bulk of the teachings in the context of the church should be a man. You know, it, you know, it should be a man, okay? Now, there's always been exceptions, and, and there always are exceptions to women who, who you know, have have in some way, shape, or form, have certain authorities in the church, of course, certain abilities to, to you know, preach and preach and share and teach. And, you know, amen to that. I mean, I'm, I'm a big, I'm a, you know, I listen and, and you know, I, I have received lots of pearls from many, many women who were fabulous, fabulous teachers, okay? But I believe that Paul is saying that for the church, that the eldership should be male and that the bulk and bread and butter of the teaching in the context of the church should be male because it's grounded in the order of creation, okay? So what the next question is this, and, and you know, you know, when you see that, right, if you flip over into the next chapter into 1 Timothy, you know, 3, he lists all of the quality, you know, all of the qualifications for, for the, you know, for, for church eldership and, you know, and for senior pastors and for deacons. And it's always gender specific. He uses the, you know, pronoun he, you know, he should be able to manage his family. He should not be a recent convert. Um, he should be a man of good reputation. Okay. So it's, so it's, you know, so it's always, so it's grounded in gender in terms of the qualifications for, you know, eldership and for that kind of authority, okay? So, um, so the next question is this. So can a woman have some of the giftings of a pastor or shepherd or of a teacher without being um, a, you know, a senior pastor or shepherd or, you know, elder of a church community? And I think yes, right? You know, right, right. I think you know, clearly, yes. I mean, it's my experience that it, you know, it's a yes with a, you know, a capital Y. But does that mean that they should occupy that role? I, I don't think so. Okay. And, 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 you know, it, it's, it, it, you know, so it's a bad analogy. It's kind of a loose analogy. You know, it's a bad analogy, but like, and, you know, I know people who are great, great woodworkers and they can come and they can make this or that with, with, you know, like a two by four and they're great, and, and they can fix things around a house great, right? But it doesn't make them a carpenter. It doesn't mean that they are carpenters or they are, you know, in the carpenter's union. It just means that they have the, they, they you know, are gifted, that they have a desire, that they enjoy doing it, and that they're good at doing it. But it doesn't mean that they're necessarily in the carpenter's union, right? So that's a poor analogy, but anyways, uh, and, you know, I think that the next thing I'm going to say is really important, right? Authority, listen, authority does not mean inferiority. It just doesn't. You know, inferiority, we we mix and match those words, I think, in this culture, right? You know, authority, inferior, you know, a lack of authority means inferiority. Uh, I, 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 you know, authority, um, not having authority does not equal inferiority. It just doesn't, Right? You know, which is we might we might think that in our modern American culture, but you know, 
not having a certain amount of, you know, not, not obtaining authority on some level does not make you inferior. It just doesn't, right? It merely describes a particular role or, you know, order of things. Okay? I mean, basically. And, and that's really important, right? Like, like there are, there, you know, and let's just look at the Trinity and we're going to close here with this, okay? The, the, you know, Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, okay? They're one in value and one in worth and one in nature and one in essence, but they have different defined roles and responsibilities. And we see that in the scriptures, right? I mean, Jesus, he, he deferred and he took a submissive role to the Father, okay? He just did. You know, it doesn't say that the Father caused him to, to submit to him. But it said, it said, but he willingly and voluntarily submitted himself. And this is an important thing. Women were never, never supposed to be forced to submit, okay, to the hierarchy of men or to men in general, right? Okay, it says, it says willingly submit, right? It says in 1 Timothy 2, I'll read it again. It says a woman should learn in quietness and full submission. Not be forced to submit, but, you know, be willing to, be willing to submit out of obedience and out of, you know, humility. And what did Jesus do? He submitted to the Father's authority out of obedience and out of humility. And he did it because he had a sense of security and, you know, he had a sense of confidence in who he was. You know, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't like because he thought he was inferior or he had an oh shucks kind of a complex. It's because he was secure in who he was. Okay. He was living out of, you know, humility, obedience, security, and confidence. And that's true st that's true power. That's true strength. Okay? It's not a sign of weakness. It's a sign of power. Okay? And that's the same thing, right? It, it's the same thing, you know? Um, so, so when a woman submits to the gender roles and the responsibilities outlined, I think, in a Bible, it's an indication. Um, so it's not an indication of her not being as valuable or not being as important it's an indication of her obedience humility humility and her power and true strength okay that's you know it's clear right it's a sign of security and power and you know again i'm just going to close with this i know i you know opened with it you know again and i'm going to do some other videos on this and um but i i you know i think the most important thing that no matter where we land on this it's okay relax. I think it's a peripheral issue. It's not a doctrinal issue. It shouldn't divide the church community because this is a this is a broken world with a lot of hurting people that need need Jesus. And there's no greater way I think that the world is going to know and see Jesus and experience experience his love than in the unity and the oneness of the church when we are loving each other and loving the world. So anyways, that's my two cents. And um, there's going to be future videos. And uh, yeah, so uh, next week we're, we, are, we, are, we are going going to have some fun. It's a different subject. And then we're going to get back to role of women in the church subject again. And uh, but yeah, but until then, have a great week. And, uh, and, and just keep your eyes on Jesus. Amen? Amen.